So now in this next flowchart, we're going to continue looking at chemical properties. And so we'll entitle it Chemical Properties 2. And here we're going to be, again, still looking at signaling molecules, but we're going to shift gears and look at a different class of signaling molecules found within the endocrine system. And this would be the signaling molecules known as hormones. So now we're going to be looking at the different classes of hormones. And if you remember, Previously, we looked at classes of local regulators, not necessarily hormones. Now, we know that hormones have this capability of either being a local regulator, if they're autocrine or paracrine, or also being a much more expansive regulator if they are, let's say, an endocrine hormone or an endocrine signaling hormone that is going through the bloodstream. So, we have three different classes of hormones. Why are they separated into three different classes? Well, it's all because of their chemical properties as signaling molecules. So the first chemical property class, let's say, of hormones would be those that are polypeptides. These are essentially hormones that are proteins. They are hundreds of amino acids long, and all of these amino acids would then uh, be shaped into different forms based off of those uh, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary uh, interactions that we see in the formation of a polypeptide. A good example of a polypeptide hormone, of a protein hormone, would be insulin. Insulin is just two polypeptide chains, so two pep chains I'll say, and these pep chains are going to be joined via disulfide bonds. So that's a very strong covalent bond, joined, uh, let me rewrite that, joined via disulfide bonds. And that's a strong, like I was saying, covalent bond that makes sure that the peptide chains stay together and are able to act together, therefore. So we have two peptide chains, hundreds of amino acids long. We have this insulin molecule that acts as a polypeptide hormone. It's a protein hormone, therefore. In addition, we also have non-protein hormones. Some people think hormones are only proteins, but there actually are hormones that are not proteins. And those would actually be considered things like steroids. Steroids are a whole class of hormones based off of their chemistry and chemical orientation. And their chemistry consists of a lipid structure. Steroids are lipids, if we remember from biological molecules. They are four fused carbon rings. So they are usually, you know, three hexagons or four hexagons, or three hexagons and a pentagon fused together, um, all of which are carbon rings. So they're uh, very much a lipid because they have tons of hydrocarbons on them, and they are all derived from cholesterol. All derived from cholesterol. So cholesterol is often associated with this very negative connotation, but believe it or not, cholesterol is absolutely necessary within the body because all the steroids like testosterone, estrogen, just to name two, need cholesterol as the backbone, and then you add different functional groups to cholesterol backbone to give you the specific steroid that is necessary, like a testosterone, like an estrogen. So that's our steroid class of hormones. Again, not proteins. These are lipids. And then finally, the last class of hormones would be the amines. And the amines are just synthesized from a single amino acid. Synthesized from a single amino acid. So they're nothing more than just one amino acid that's been altered in such a way that it has turned into an amine class of hormones. So hormones can be proteins, they can be steroids, or they can be amines. And these are the different classes of hormones. And then finally, the way to really sort of differentiate these hormones, a good way to understand how they work in terms of their structure, is to look at their function. And their function is based off of this variation in solubility. So polypeptides are going to vary in how they are soluble, and how steroids are soluble, and how amines are soluble. Meaning that, let's say you have an aqueous environment. You have a very much a water environment. You're going to have the hormones that are going to be soluble in an aqueous environment. And those hormones would be those that have our polypeptide hormones. Because again, polypeptide hormones will consist usually of amino acids that have uh, very hydrophilic functional groups on them. And those functional groups, because they're polypeptides, they're going to all interact with the aqueous environment nicely, like dissolves like. So polypeptide hormones will usually be nicely dissolved in an aqueous environment. So insulin can very easily dissolve itself in the blood because the blood is mainly an aqueous environment. Same idea with amine hormones. 
So both of these are probably going to be very much hydrophilic uh, structures, hydrophilic in terms of their chemical properties, therefore, and thus they can dissolve in a hydrophilic environment, aqueous environment, like dissolves like. That's what we mean about solubility. And then, of course, the opposite would be, let's say we have a lipid-rich environment. If we have a lipid-rich environment, we would then have things like steroids, because what? Steroids are lipids. Like dissolves like. So steroids can easily be soluble in a lipid-rich environment and also anything that's a nonpolar hormone. So then you would say that polar hormones would be the ones that are in an aqueous environment. Both of these are probably pretty much polar. And then anything that has nonpolar functional groups, nonpolar uh, nature to it, would then be dissolved in a lipid-rich environment. Take a look at figure 45.4 to really understand the idea of solubility in a visual sense. And that covers our look at chemical properties. Remember, we have classes of local regulators and we have classes of hormones. And those are separated because of their different chemical properties and they're also subdivided, let's say, based off of their solubilities.